you're going to take your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 46. Psalm 46 is where I would invite you to turn. And as I, I, I don't think I specifically mentioned this last week. I did, not in, I did not intentionally not mention it, but Rob Morgan's book, The Strength That You Need, is serving as a guide for this series. And the scriptures that he has chosen are serving as the scriptural references that I'm using for this little mini-series of messages. And so today we come to Psalm 46. I actually preached from Psalm 46 nearly two years ago. And in that experience, it actually became one of my most treasured passages of Scripture anywhere in all 66 books of the Bible. And so I'm hoping and praying that what God did in my heart then, what God has renewed in my heart from preparing for today afresh and anew, will also serve you well. As I've I've entitled my message, I hope that it will prove to be exactly what it says in the title. I hope it will be a soft pillow for your weary soul. A soft pillow for your weary soul. So, whenever I mention one of my kids' names when I'm standing up in the pulpit, they immediately break out in hives. They immediately break out in nervousness. Even Jennifer will sometimes get a little nervous when they sense that I'm about to say something about them. Well, this morning it's Joanna's turn. Um, And Joanna, I'll tell you what, Jennifer and I both are just thrilled with the beautiful young woman that Joanna has become. Some of you, you've heard me jokingly say that back in the day when Joanna was like two, two and a half, three, three going on four, going on five, I, I I didn't know whether one day she would become a single missionary on the backside of an unreached world or a member of the Hell's Angels. I I just did not know. Thankfully, though God's not called her to be a single missionary, that's obvious because she's married to Will, uh, she definitely did not become one of the hell's angels. She's become a delightful young lady, such strong maternal instincts. But boy, let me tell you something. If you're in Joanna's inner circle and she texts you, and you don't reply within like three to five minutes max, she's like, is everything okay? Um, if, she, if she texts Jennifer and just got a question for her, and the clock's ticking, and the ticking, and ticking, and 15 minutes have rolled off, all of a sudden, I'll get a text. Dad, are you with mom? Is everything okay? She, she can really have a tendency to kind of worry. Now, granted, Scripture says we shouldn't worry at all, but even if we give some room for humanness, she's got a little bit of a tendency to worry quicker than maybe the average person. But then again, all of us know something about being stricken with at least some degree of panic. Maybe it is someone who is prone to reply to a text within five minutes, and it's been 15, 30, 40. Maybe it is somebody that you've called, and, and, and you've called, and you've called, and you've called, and there's no answer, and, and there's almost always an answer, and you leave a message. And when you've left a message in the past, they've always returned the call within a matter of a, a few hours, and it's been all day long. Or maybe you get that phone call in the wee hours of the morning and immediately you're wondering who's calling at this time of night and why are they calling? Panic, uneasiness, finding ourselves between a rock and a hard place. There are a lot of things that can generate uneasiness in our souls. Um, A pain develops. And you, it, you've, you've never felt that before. And it's not just been a few seconds. It's, it's, it's been there for a couple of hours. And then it's been there now for two or three days. And now it's been there for a couple of weeks. Biopsies are ordered by your doctor. Um, I don't know what all you might be going through right now. Um, but there are a, a number of reasons why we can face uncertainties. And so what are you going to do when those uncertainties come? When you're battling anxiety, when you're facing the unavoidable negative effects of aging, when your children are struggling in school, when your finances are strained like maybe they've never been before. For all of those potentialities and 10,000 more, I would like to recommend that you and I open our Hebrew hymnal to Psalm 46, and as one author put, get a big old dose 
of Psalm 46. Nothing wrong with a dose of medicine and even with a spoonful of sugar to help it go down. But beyond all of that, and sometimes what we need is a big old dose of God's Word, a good old big dose of reassurance from the Scriptures. So my prayer is that the truths of this psalm will provide a reassuring, sweet, soft pillow for your weary soul. So this psalm is a psalm of radical trust in the midst of an intimate threat. The historical setting may be, notice I'm saying it may be because we do not know with absolute certainty because uh, the heading of the psalm does not give us the specific historical context. But when you read the psalm and you piece together other components of Israelite history, it may be when Jerusalem was under threat by the Assyrian king Sennacherib. He had conquered Egypt way back in 710 B.C. He's plundering, he is killing, he is conquering. One nation after another is crumbling right at his feet, as it were. And now, next on his agenda is Jerusalem. And so, Sennacherib sends a message to Hezekiah, who is the current king of Israel. Of, of, of Israel. And he sends this message and basically says, guess what? Here's what I'm going to do. And if you've got any sense at all, you'll surrender. Well, what are you going to do? Because by the time he receives the letter, they have basically surrounded Jerusalem. They are besieged. Um, as a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that Sennacherib himself described the current setting as having Jerusalem and having Hezekiah surrounded like a caged bird. And the people of Israel, they're aware of what's going on. Um, war seemed inevitable. Death in, uh, war seemed unavoidable. Death inevitable. Mercy impossible. The residents are trapped. What are we going to do? Hezekiah takes that letter and he goes into the temple with it and he lays it down as it were and says, Lord, this is something you need to read. Not implying that he didn't already know, but that's, that's in essence what Hezekiah is doing. He takes this letter in and says, Lord, you need to read this. We need help. And so I want you to listen to a part of the prayer that Hezekiah prayed in conjunction with beseeching God to help them during their, this time of imminent threat. I'm going to read from 2 Kings 19, verses 16 to 19. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O oh Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O oh Lord, are God alone. So he's not just praying for the preservation of life. He's not just praying for the preservation of their houses. He is praying for the preservation of God's name. Lord, if, if we fall, if, we, if we're wiped off the planet, the whole world will have a reason to mock you. And Lord, I don't want that to happen. So w w would you please deliver us so that everybody will know that you are the true and living God. And folks, that's exactly what God did. If you were to read the account in Kings, 185,000, everybody hear me? 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died overnight, and there's no report on why. Other than the fact that God must have sent his angelic warrior and said, enough of this. Secular historians have no clue for what happened. Historical records confirm the, the, the record in our scriptures. And that night, 185,000 men died. Well, 
This psalm is the psalm that was comprised as a result of that context. And this is the kind of thing that God's people need to keep in mind when the circumstances of life are not what we wished they were. So you'll notice in Psalm 46, there are three sections, three stanzas, each one concluding with selah, which means think about this. Meditate on this. The first stanza is in verses 1 through 3. And I'm not going to read all the verses. If I read all the verses and if I try to do some kind of an exegesis and application to all the verses, well, we'll be here for three whiles. And I don't think you came for three whiles. You came for one while. And I'll be happy if we can just get one while. So the first three verses talk about God's trustworthiness. God's trustworthiness. In a few moments, we will read part of it where it talks about mountains. Even if the, word, the, the earth trembles so that mountains are cast into the oceans, um, there, there's a confidence that's going to be established in the Lord. The second stanza is verses 4 through 7. And here the whole mood of the poem changes from the disturbances that are existing in, in verses 1 through 3. In verses 4 through 7, there's a calmness. From the roar of the rushing waters in the first three verses, now there's a, a peaceful um, description of a well-watered city of God. Um, and then you come to the third stanza. It's verses 8 through 11. And these verses call for a reflection on God's mighty deeds in days gone by and the reassurance of his glorious exaltation in days yet to come. So here's, here's what I'd like to do with my message this morning. I want to give you some, I, I want you to remember the Lord's identity and then respond accordingly. So I, I want to give you three descriptions of the Lord's identity. And after we've done that, I want to give you two exhortations of response in, according, in accordance with his identity. So number one, remember, look, okay, we're going to remember the Lord's identity. And here's the first one. Remember his protective presence. Remember his protective presence. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. God is our refuge and strength. Refuge, a condition of being safe or sheltered from pursuit, from danger, or for trouble, from trouble. Most all of us know that sometimes there are occasions for diplomats or American citizens in various places around the world if trouble strikes and there is hostility that arises against us. Our diplomats or American citizens will flee for refuge at the embassy. There are some times when a battered and bruised woman will seek refuge in some kind of a safe house because of the way her husband or her ex-husband has been beating her. In recent years, an extensive construction project has taken place beneath the west wing of the uh, White House. It's believed to be this super bunker that under any circumstances of a threat from another country, the president and, and other important people could go there and be safe, whether it's from nuclear, biological, chemical, cyber, or radiological warfare. Rumors are also surrounding, or, or, or rumors are also floating around that such bunkers are being built in Moscow as well. And you just wonder what, what kind of plans are being made in these bunkers, these places of refuge being in place. Well, folks, I think you and I both know no place on earth is ultimately safe. No place on this earth is ultimately a place of refuge. But we do have such a place, if you will, in the person of Jesus. He's our refuge. God is our refuge. He's our hiding place. He's our shelter of safety. So verse 1 goes on and says, God is our refuge, a very present help in trouble. That is, God helps you when you need it. God helps you when the need is such that the time is right for him to help. Now, I don't think I've got critics in here, 
But just imagine that someone would say, well, no, wait a minute. God is a very present help in time of trouble. And you said that Jesus is our refuge. Well, what about Lazarus? I've heard preaching about Lazarus and Lazarus being one of Jesus' dear friends. And this Jesus that you're talking about being a refuge and a very present help in time of trouble, Jesus knew. Jesus knew that Lazarus was in trouble. His sisters, they saw that he was in trouble. And Jesus, you weren't so much a very present help in time of trouble because Lazarus died. In response, I would say in part, in some cases, the help we need is not always what we think we need. We usually think we need deliverance from the trouble that we're in, deliverance from the agony, deliverance from hardships. But note, God is described as a very present help in trouble. He's not saying he's going to exempt you from all trouble, but he will be a helper for you in your trouble. God promises his presence during troubles, not the absence of them. Don't listen to those nut jobs that are on some of these cable TV shows. Don't listen to what they write in some of these books that if you'll just have enough faith, all your troubles will go bye-bye. It's just not biblical. It's just not sound. Better than deliverance from our troubles is God's presence in our troubles. If God delivered us from all troubles, do you know how sorry and spoiled brats we would be? No, God does not promise us deliverance. He, de he promises us his presence in those. So I think all of you know that it rains on the just and the unjust. In God's sovereignty, in God's providence, the just experience some of the same troubles that the world experiences. The just and the unjust go through tornadoes and hurricanes together. The just and the unjust go through cancer and radiation treatments together. Um, Jamie, and I realize not a lot of you know Jamie Merritt. More of you might would know his parents than you know Jamie, but um, Jamie texted me while I was getting ready for this morning, and he said, Jeff, would you please pray for me? I got my first radiation treatment today, and I'm nervous about it. I said, I sure will. And by the way, I'm preaching on Psalm 46 today. It'll be on the live stream this evening. I would highly recommend that you meditate on Psalm 46, the first three verses, and verses 10 and 11. And I, I believe that'll be a help to him because the just and the unjust go through those things together. The just and the unjust get injured in car wrecks and sometimes die from the same. The just and the unjust go through pandemics together. So folks, listen carefully. God does not give his people a stay out of trouble pass. But he does promise to be with us until they pass or until we pass. You understand what I just said? God does not give his people a stay out of trouble pass, but he does promise to be with us until they pass or until we pass. So 1527, Martin Luther one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation to whom we owe a debt of gratitude. Martin Luther fell into a deep depression after learning that his dear friend uh, Leonard Kaiser had been burned at the stake in the Netherlands for holding to Reformation doctrines. Luther felt guilty because unlike his friend who died at the stake, he was at home. He was enjoying the comforts of regular life. Luther turned to Psalm 46, and he pondered it, and he meditated on it. And he kept pondering and meditating until he wrote a, a, a picture about its truth, giving us one of the greatest hymns that the church has ever sung that's based on Psalm 46. It says in part, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. That's our God. 
So I want you to remember the Lord's identity. Remember his protective presence. Number two, remember his providential power. Remember his providential power. For that, you could look, make a note in verse 6 and verses 8 and 9. But notice with me verse 6. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. And the earth melts. He utters his voice. So I've coached basketball. Well, with, with my kids, I've coached basketball, soccer, uh, baseball, volleyball. I've done a little bit of it all. And I've played most of the same, and some of you have. And I can remember even um, Rod Whitley, Alice's husband, coaching us in the Teens of Flame Athletic Conference. This was teen uh, basketball. And I can remember him. So keep in mind, we, we would place about half our games at the old Grace Church gym. And some of you, you've been there. I mean, it, it's fairly small, tile floor, concrete block walls. It didn't take a whole bunch of screaming Baptists in there for it to get loud. And of course, when church folks are playing against church folks, the competition level is extremely high. I didn't say the play was extremely high caliber, but the competition's high. And so in that gym with a bunch of parents and church folks screaming and hollering their teams on, it could get loud. And I can still hear Rod Whitley saying, when you get on that court, I don't want you listening to your parents' voice. I don't want you listening to your girlfriend's voice. I want you to listen to my voice. And so even when... Um, basketball is played on a high level, whether it's at Cameron Indoor Stadium with the Cameron Crazies. Coach K wants his players to hear his voice above all the noise. Well, folks, God wants us to hear his voice above all the noise of this world. And if you'll listen to God's voice, it will let you be reminded that one day, though the current kingdoms of this earth may totter, and though the earth one day will melt under the fire of his fervent uh, punishment, man, his voice, I'm in control. I'm sovereign. And there are no circumstances that throw me into a tizzy. So I want you to remember his providential power. Um, Second verse of Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which is my favorite. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Folks, Satan rages. He's a roaring lion. And the day is coming when our God will just speak a word. And into Gehenna for all eternity, he will go. So I want you to remember his providential power. Thirdly, I want you to remember his preeminent position. His preeminent position. Drop down to verse 10. God speaks and says, I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now we know that there is a New Testament parallel to the truth of Psalm 46 verse 10. And it's found in Philippians chapter 2. In verses 10 and 11, and you're familiar with it, though you might not readily remember what the scripture reference is. The day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is exactly whom we believe him to be right now. One day, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is exactly whom the scriptures said he was. God, King, Messiah. Savior. So we, we've reflected and tried to remember the Lord's identity. Now I want to give you two responses to those identity marks. Number one, fear not. Fear not. 
but trust in him as your Savior. Uh, verse 2. So God is our refuge, present help in trouble. Therefore, because that's true about him, therefore we will not fear. We will not fear. Now, granted, if you, if you want to reread verse 2, in any translation you want, you won't find the word faith there. But I think it's implied that if I'm not going to fear in light of who my God is, that means I've got faith in his identity. I've got faith that he, if he says he is who he is, if he is our refuge, if he is a present, a present help in trouble, and therefore my response is not going to be one of fear, it means that I have faith. I have faith in God's trustworthiness. I have faith in his faithfulness. So as one writer said, what matters is not whether you have faith, but whether who or what you have faith in is trustworthy. Now, you can have all the faith in the world, but if the object of your faith is not trustworthy, is not strong, is not reliable, is not omnipotent, <laughs> well, that, that ain't going to work out under certain circumstances. But our God who is who he is. And because he is, we can fear not. Praise the Lord. Our God is perfectly and wondrously trustworthy. And therefore, we will not fear, this author says, we will not fear though the earth trembles, though the mountains crumble into the sea, though its waters rage and foam, though the mountains quake. So, so what, what, what might we need to put in that equation for your though? I would like to urge you, my dear brothers and sisters, I would like to urge you to say in your heart, in your soul, I will not fear. Though I go through a financial crisis, I will not fear though my marriage ends up dissolving. I will not fear though my spouse dies. I will not fear though I lose my job. I will not fear Though my closest of friends betray me, I will not fear. Though my health is rapidly deteriorating, I will not fear. Though I'm all alone in this house that seems so big now, I will not fear. Though the doctors do not have any answers at the moment, I will not fear. Though some of my dearest family and friends have died, I will not fear. Even if I test positive for COVID-19. I will not fear. A second response that I think is appropriate for any and all believers to give to God in light of who he is. Fear not, trust in him as your savior, and then be still. Be still. Yield to him as your sovereign. So that brings us drop down again to verse 10. Verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. In other words, cease and desist. Stop running around like your whole life is out of control. Stop the panic. Stop all that you might be doing to act as if you're actually in control when you're not. Just be still. Stop striving. Stop manipulating. Stop trying to orchestrate your life. Quit trying to control everything and, every, and everyone. Just be still. Be still and know that I am God. This is not just head knowledge. Now, I, I, I have appealed to your head knowledge. It's got to be there to begin with, but that head knowledge needs to make a straight line to our heart. And what, what we know from Scripture needs to affect how we respond. And there's no reason for fear. There's every reason to be still and to be calm and to be collected and to be confident because of who our God is. It's as though God is saying, stop trying to play God and know that I am God. And so it's as if God says, if I'm going to take care of the nations, can I not take care of you? 
if I can handle all the challenges facing the world, can I not handle yours? If I am in control of the noisy chaos and all the corruption touching this world, can I not control that which touches your world? And I think we all know the answer is yes. This is the same counsel that Jesus gave to his disciples, remember? Three reasons why they were troubled. One of them's going to betray, one's going to deny, and Jesus says, I'm not going to be here, but it's just another matter of hours, days. And they were troubled. And what did Jesus say? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, will believe also in me. And then he reminds them of his plan for the future. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. So uh, Rob Morgan in his book tells the story that Psalm 46 has actually been called the earthquake psalm because it avows God in an unchanging re- as an unchanging refuge in tectonic times. Perhaps it's also acquired this title because of a series of events that shook London in 1750. On February the 8th, an earthquake rattled the British Empire and terrified the whole city. Not only did the buildings shake, but there were reverberating noises that almost sounded like claps of thunder that just kept repeating themselves. Inhabitants who were struck with fear ran into the streets, afraid of being buried alive in their homes or in other buildings. A month later, evangelist Charles Wesley was beginning an early morning sermon when another earthquake struck, a far worse one. Worshippers panicked, fearing their church building would, would collapse. People were screaming. Children were crying. Wesley, to his credit and to, and to God's credit, Wesley had the presence of mind on the spot to quote parts of Psalm 46. We will not fear, though the earth be removed and the hills be carried into the midst of the sea, for the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, he said. He later said that God filled his heart with faith and his mouth with words to calm and comfort his listeners. Ten days later, another earthquake rattled the south coast of England, and a prognosticator said that an even worse one was a coming. His words were widely accepted and people lived in fear. They camped out in the streets and squares, afraid their houses would fall on them. Multitudes actually turned to Jesus for salvation because they were fearful that judgment day was coming. That final predicted earthquake never came. But to reassure the populace, Wesley published two small collections of hymns that have since been referred to as his earthquake hymns. One of them is based on Psalm 46. God, this is what it says in part, God, the omnipresent God, our strength and refuge stands ready to support our load and bear us in his hands. Doesn't these truths that we've looked at tonight provide a soft pillow for your weary soul? Um, Any of you have trouble sleeping? I'm I'm not having trouble now. I'm actually taking a couple of things that seems to do the trick. Nothing prescription yet, but uh, I went about 18 months or so where my sleep was very disrupted. I I might have a hard time going to sleep or I might fall asleep, wake up, or I might wake up at 2.30, 3.15, 1.37 and have a heart so I can sleep better now. Are any of you having trouble sleeping because of what's going on in the world or in your life? I don't think that was a part of my situation, but might it be a part of yours? If you're having trouble sleeping, at least don't let it be because when you put your head on your pillow, at least let it not be because you don't have confident thoughts and beliefs in the great God of Psalm 46. Let's pray. Father, I think this psalm bears just meditation, bears reading, bears memorization. 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Oh, Lord, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I've got a little bit of experience under my belt now. But still, we, whether we're preachers, evangelists, or married to the same, whether we've been in God's house since we were children, or if we're relatively new to the faith, circumstances of life always bring with it a temptation to fear, a temptation to not be still. But Lord, I pray that these reminders this morning and those who might listen to them this evening or at some other time, I pray that these precious reminders about your identity will help us to respond like we should, to not fear and to be still. Thank you for being our God, the God of the scriptures. May we take comfort in being sons and daughters of yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As always, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for giving attention to God's word. And I pray it's been an encouragement to you.